Branching into a brand new theme here in the Levity Zone, we roll the door open on the Digibarn. The Digibarn is my personal collection of vintage computers and much more. Proudly housed in a big red two-story barn here at Ancient Oaks Farm. So how did this all get started? Well, back in the 80s, I went straight from college at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles to my dream job at a small startup named Elixir Technologies. It was my dream job because back in 1981, when I was just starting college in Kamloops, up in British Columbia, Canada, I happened upon a techie magazine that had on its cover a shot of the screen of the brand new Xerox Star computer. The icons, folders, and windows, all operated with a mouse, truly captivated me. Back then, you typed text into computers, a line at a time, and I was struggling to build graphical software on top of our college's PDP-11, one of the only real computers in our town. Seeing the star with its bitmap display, I thought to myself, this is going to be a sandbox for the mind. So when I met Elixir founder Basit Hamid on my 25th birthday in 1987, and he showed me the Three Rivers Perk computer with its rich graphical interface and asked me, we need you to join us to help bring this to the PC, I almost jumped out of my proverbial pants. So for those years in the late 80s, I coded some of the first high-resolution graphical software to run on ordinary PCs, and this was sold around the world by Xerox. Getting to know pioneering Xerox researchers and developers, I discovered that they had not only invented the Star desktop interface, but developed many of the other personal computer innovations we take for granted today at its Palo Alto Research Center, known as PARC. I became obsessed with the Xerox story, and around that time I started to collect computer artifacts and their stories. When I bought the farm in 1998, they all went into a beautiful two-story red barn here on the property, and presto, the Digibarn Computer Museum was born. I opened the barn to tours and open houses in 2002, and many visitors, well-known and lesser-known, took my guided tour through computing history. One of those visitors was Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple Computer, and who is literally a neighbor over the hill from us in Los Gatos. Waz, or The Waz, as he is sometimes called, first came to the Digibarn to be interviewed for a documentary back in December 2006. My friend and Digibarn co-founder, Alan Lundell, was there with camera in hand as we recorded Waz giving his talking tour of a smorgasbord of some of our running versions of his old machines the Apple II, III, and the even older Altair 8800. After the interview was done, I gave Waz a personal tour of the whole collection, sharing stories and nerd elder wisdom. Here is the play-by-play of what you are about to hear. After Waz's own narration through Apple history, Alan and I took him upstairs to a display of the legendary Xerox Alto workstation. The Alto was the computer he saw when he and Steve Jobs visited Park in 1979. The Alto begat the star, but also so blew away the Apple co-founders that they went off to copy many of its features in the Lisa and then Macintosh computers. Woz then shared why the star and systems like Apple's Lisa failed. Stepping over into the home computer area, We then dove deep into his elegant, minimal 1978 design for the Apple II's floppy disk controller. The newer Audrey web appliance of 1999 then captured Waz's attention. When he said, I've never had a touchscreen Mac, but there would be a lot of applications for it, you should realize that this was just three weeks before the launch of the iPhone in January 2007. Next up, Waz wondered at the Nova Core Memory Mattress and mused about what was lost when Core and typewriters went away. We didn't exactly blow up with excitement when I booted up Windows 1.0 from 1985, 
But Woz was tickled by some of the stuff Microsoft lifted directly from Macintosh's menus. Right next to the primitive version of Windows was a much more advanced running version of the Elixir desktop and applications, which, as mentioned before, I helped bring to life. I gave Woz a quick tour of this PC-based rendition of the document design capabilities of the Xerox Star, after which Woz said, This is a lot better than that, i.e. Windows at the time. It was a proud moment for me, let me tell you. We finished up with the Twiggy drives on the Lisa, to which Woz exclaimed, Such a disaster! We then veered into the Apple Brooklyn project and efforts to keep the Apple II alive. Woz then revealed that he was the only fan of the first Mac Portable and how he coaxed out credit for being the chief engineer of the Franklin Ace, a direct clone of the Apple II. Salam Ismail of the Vintage Computer Festival then arrived and asked Woz if Apple might bring back the Apple II as a handheld machine. Your Dr. Bruce then revealed that he might have the plans for the Apple II and permission from Apple's legal department to boot. As we were musing about the resurrection of Woz's original machine, by pure chance, a delivery van with my brand new Apple iMac on board pulled up to the barn. The driver, not suspecting or believing that Apple's co-founder was standing right there, had Woz signed for it. We then toted it into the barn, unboxed the computer, and then Woz signed that too, marking the end of a beautiful day at the Digi Barn. So listen away. It's the Woz like you will never hear him anywhere else. Oh. Hey, some of our old equipment. Apple II. Boy, those slots turned out to be important. Wow, look at the original, yeah, gold-covered memory chips. Wow. Programming the 6502. It's a microprocessor we chose for this. Still in use in so many products to this day. There's a calculator. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I used to know how to use this. Alrighty, I just did a multiplication. Oh, it's upside down. <laughs> yep, the manuals. Manuals were so important to us. This was an important, important manual. Just kind of scrapped together every piece of documentation I and a few others could generate. And Mike Scott put the manual together. I do, I remember that book. Our cassette tapes we shipped with the computers had our programs on. So you load the cassette tape into a normal cassette tape player, push the button, and beep, it would, your program would load into memory and run. And that's what we stored them on. The basic for an Apple One. <laughs> Floppy disk drives I remember well. The Apple Three. One of our products that didn't go too well. And lots of versions, lots of versions of the Apple Two. The Apple III was when IBM came out with their business machine. We looked at how the Apple IIs were selling. And everyone, all these businessmen would buy an Apple II, and they'd plug in an extra memory board, and they'd plug in an extra, extra displays, extra more characters you could see on a, a display that was like a TV set, so they could see more months on their spreadsheets. So we said, well, we'll build one product that has it all, the Apple III. Build it all in, one piece, exactly what the user wants. Eventually, we even came out with these profile hard disks. These are like five or ten megabytes. That's all. Kind of too tiny to even think about. But they, God, they stored hundreds of programs on them. Beep, turned on and run it. And the Apple III, we kind of lost out to IBM with their PC in those days, but they had the marketing arm. Okay, great. Then we got into the floppy disk controller. That was a supreme design of my own. So few chips doing so much. With a little microprocessor in the computer helping out. So it was a real strong, real strong interaction between the hardware and the ability to put software on a computer, save parts. And once once we had a floppy disk, yeah, we'd ship a lot of floppy disks like this around. People put all their programs on and buy them from other companies and the world had an easy explosion. Put the drive down and we got some software there for you to load on to run on the Apple II. Just reach over there and uh, close the drive door. 
on the right. Yeah. We read it. Okay. It's a surprise for you. <laughs> Here it comes. Ah. The S Festival. What a reminder. Now that was. <laughs> that's a long time ago. I hardly remember that. Yes, pixels. Wow, what memories. The S Festival is planned for Labor Day weekend, 1982. It will be a celebration to introduce the US decade. Secondly, it will celebrate the role of the personal computer and other technological advancements as vehicles which enable people to communicate ideas more effectively. Yes, you bet. For the celebration, we are bringing together the finest contemporary and country western musical talent. In addition to the musical entertainment, the festival will feature exhibits of exciting new applications of computer technology in communication, education, small business, music, and ecology. The festival will provide a unique opportunity for new entrepreneurs and major companies to display their latest developments in a non-commercial environment. An exciting new event. The first ever CompU Olympics will be held on site for teams from computer user groups to compete in various problem solving events which will be designed especially for the US Festival. With your help, Alan, I'd like to inform computer hobbyists about the celebration, give them an opportunity to exchange information and to enjoy the many elements of the US Festival. Advanced tickets will be available to computer user groups one month prior to the general public. Group discounts are available. Metzger and Company will be contacting you to answer any questions you may have. Oh yeah, Bonnie Metzger did our PR. I look forward to you joining us in the celebration. I would like to invite you and some of your staff to the US Festival as my guests. Please RSVP Bonnie at Metzger and Company for your tickets. All right. <laughs> That's really something to come up with. <laughs> We're done. That's what you said to me. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, uh, yeah, it had to be sent like in physical mail back in those days. That's right. On a floppy disk. Oh, look what we have here. We can toggle in an address and push a button and pop it into memory. Make it, a, make, pop it into a register. And then we'll toggle another number and we'll make it go straight into memory. You betcha. And advance the address. That's how that's how <laughs> that's how all computers worked and looked. It's beautiful. It's just so beautiful. Wow. That's the Alto. The original Alto. That's the Alto with the original that's the original mouse from Xerox. They had something different than the Alto. They were working on the, the Alto Dorado. at the time. The Dorado. I don't it was know. a bigger screen like that. Yeah, because yeah, I didn't even remember what the shape of their mouse. Was. Look at this right under the fingertip, because they figured out after about five years of research, people associated the cursor with the finger if, it, if the pickup was there, and everybody else moved the ball back there. It's like the QWERTY keyboard. Huh. Isn't that so funny? They did it the right way. Yeah, and look at this. This is a QWERTY Where's the world gone now? Key set. Oh, it's all still kind of so it's in all the wrong place. Infrared. This is all, this is so you can hit a cut, copy, paste mm -hmm. and do menu selections without touching the keyboard. Two-handed operation. I don't recall them doing that. Yeah, that's called that. a corded key set. Yeah. Torn out of the ceiling at Xerox Park. And, and this is Dave yeah, oh Boggs, yeah. who co-invented Ethernet. This is his drop to his computer. Well, ThickNet was just unimaginable in a home. But they had ThinNet also. And Apple came out with some cards that I got the adapter. Yeah. So I wired my house up with ThinNet. But everywhere you went, you had two cables with a connector bridging them together. If you look in a computer, okay. they both have to plug in separately. It was so inconvenient. It was, wow. So I tried 10 base T after that. This is 3 megabit and, and 10 megabit uh, thick net. But mm -hmm. it's from 1978. So Three it's early. To 10. 3 to yeah, 10. Yeah, I, I got myself point to point as close as I could to have the least amount of, amount yeah. of like jumbled up stuff sticking out like that Craig computer. And this was actually done by a, a, a robot yeah. arm that would do this. Oh. It was one of the first ones yeah. called Stitch Welded. Yeah, all my prototypes, that's what I did. You did that. Yeah. But when yeah. Steve Jobs would hang wire him, he, he would um, zip zip um, wire wrap tool it. Yeah. And then when uh, Bill and Fernandes wire wrapped my early computer, Green Soda computer, he wire wrapped zip zip. And talking. Pearl Smith mm. always made these little ties around the bundles. He had a really neat wire wrapping technique. Yeah. Oh. I remember. Daniel showed me the, his uh, Mac wire. I believe it. I believe yeah. It. it was the first computer. It was the computer everybody saw and kind of copied because it had a graphical interface with trash bins and folders and stuff. And this was from 1981. And so everybody looked at that. And we actually found, Daniel and I found the original Macintosh business plan from 
July of 81 that showed the whole multi-year plan for Apple for the, both the Mac project and the Lisa project. And it was presumed lost. I have scans of it. It's amazing reading. Wow. Amazing reading. If you wanted, I could send it to you. This was their book, Fumbling the Future. Uh, Xerox invented and ignored. So this room sort of a Xerox room. And here's their yeah. first touchpad mouse in 1980. This is a CPM machine that had a full-page graphic. Weird yeah. stuff. And wow. a touchpad mouse. No idea all the stuff they'd done. They had done, yeah, it's incredible. This is the machine that OS X was written on. Mm -hmm. the, the Three Rivers Perk. And too nine early for that kind of a machine. Yeah. Because yeah. Apple proved it. Yeah, and these Apple went in too early. They went in maybe five, ten years early. With the Mac and by doing that, they lost all their market share. To uh, Microsoft. Yeah, they lost the market share game. Mm -hmm. And um, Microsoft was smart enough not to build it till it was ready for the price, the masses to buy it. Mm -hmm. The marketing the marketing knowledge of what can you... And Steve Jobs was always saying, Bill Gates could have done these great things for you, the world, but he just sat back and collected money. Well, he meant Bill Gates could have done what we did, step up to the higher price machine that was really above what the world wanted in the masses at the time, and then Apple would have been on a fair competitive spectrum. Yeah. If Microsoft built the same machine at the same price, yeah, then we'd be fair with them, but... Yeah. They were they were building the machine that really was the right one for their era. For and eventually, time, yeah. eventually, this machine would be the right one because yeah, of cost. That's, that's why yeah. Lisa, which cost ten thousand bucks, and had a hard drive price was way too. too ahead of its. Remember price. the remember the T shirt uh, Windows ninety five equals. No, you know why why Lisa cost ten thousand. Why? It had a megabyte of RAM, oh. which is for a GUI machine to do it the that's right way right. with multi processing. You yeah. tended yeah. to need a megabyte of RAM. Macintosh made the screen so tiny, black and white only. They did every trick in the world to cut the RAM down to one twenty eight k. Special programming tricks wow. took longer design, but Lisa needed one megabyte of RAM, and that cost five thousand retail yeah. in that time. So of yeah. course, the Lisa computer so cost ten thousand. Yeah. Wow! Yeah. Wow! Yeah. yeah, it was all RAM. These things huh. cost. 13, See, we were jumping. You get ahead of your time, and you just wait a couple of years, and eventually that's the right machine to make price-wise. This thing, it's hard to do a graphic machine. This thing cost thirteen thousand dollars a seat, and needed to have a server and a fully. Yeah, Ethernet. I remember. And and uh, it drew ten amps. I didn't remember the server business. It had to have a server, so you needed a full-on server, way ahead of its time. No, no, way, way that ahead. was why they hardly sold any stars. Yeah, uh, I don't know, maybe a hundred thousand or something. Yeah. Hundred thousand? I don't I think, think they, I they sold. Bet we, yeah, between I this they only one sold and a few hundred stars. between this one and this one, yeah, they sold it all big companies and governments. There were a lot uh, of government like, contracts. Yeah, right? these are from the government oh, here. And, and let's go in the next room. The truck pedal came to the garage. Looked at the Apple II. It sort of acted like he liked it, and we thought we had a chance to sell it to Commodore. We go right. over there. By then, he's, yeah. he has sold Commodore on doing the same thing, but real cheap because they didn't know how to do the color and all. <laughs> and one of the things I always like, and I put the card down below, but mm -hmm. North Star, built-in five and a quarter inch floppies. If you pull their drive controller out, which I did to compare to yours, mm -hmm. there's 28 chips on the single drive controller on the North Star. Because yeah. that was contemporary with the Apple II. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I always show them together. I always show them your design for two floppies and, and then I this one. North Star might have been the one I had a manual for, and I opened it up to look at their schematic and see what I wasn't doing that I should have. Okay. Because yeah. I didn't know what a disk controller was supposed to do. Right. Yeah. So right. I looked at their schematic, and in the end I saw all it does is read and write and seek tracks, just like mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so... In and honor, mine was mine had the processor for software, so it was more flexible. That's why I called it better. So I'm right to hold up the two different boards. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That's good. I'm glad. I, I got but my when I started, right. I didn't I didn't know their board, their design, or anything. I didn't know how many chips. I just knew they had a board. That's they, actually. Ridiculous. So when I finished, yeah, when I finished, and when I first went to check, I only had five chips reading and writing. I didn't have track stepping or anything. Yeah. That's when I got scared about what am I leaving out. So I went back to their design. Here's your Saul. Yeah. We Saul. have. Several saws. In fact, um, we were just on oh, the Osborne. We were, I just look got at the, the look at the shape. That's you know yeah, yeah. that was the paradigm well, of the modern eighty column lowercase lower case yeah. takes the place of IBM Selectric. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the challengers were kind of copying yeah. the saw. The same wooden sides and whatnot on a couple of them, but uh, this weighs so much and it was unexpandable. That's one of the problems yeah. with the saw. Yeah, the Apple II was so expandable, especially in memory. Yeah, that was remarkable. Saved us for VisiCalc and floppies. Mm -hmm. And all of this rest is like the beige invasion of the 80s and even up to weird things that didn't survive. Yeah, like this. Oh, I remember. I had you remember the Audrey? Did you? It's an yeah. Audrey. It's an no, Audrey. That, that was the Audrey. It yeah. was so lousy because I had bought the uh, Sony one in Japan. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And the Sony one, you could take take off the stand, carry it around your house, sit on the toilet and be watching television. Oh, yeah. It actually piped kidding. television over wow. our, over um, wow. 802.11. That Sony one was so much better than the Audrey. Wow. 
Mm. It's too bad because they killed uh, three times, killed the Audrey. The division had the Audrey. It had yeah. one other product. It was a radio. I remember they had a big ad and it called uh, Love Hurts, H-E-R-T-Z. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, what was the name of that radio? Love Hurts. Huh? Love it, but it was, a, it, was, it was a radio over the internet. And you basically had two dials, tune stations and tune volume. Wow. And it was just, it was done like an old style radio. Huh. God, it was gorgeous. Just pulling oh, up all the internet radio stations. Yes, and they're, they're, they had a server that constantly checked which ones were delivering at good speed. Wow. So it only brought up, as you tuned the stations, it would only bring up the ones that were good at that time Sweet. of the day. Okay. That's right. This See is a bizarre really thing. Hard. This thing is so bizarre. It's called the Miko Macintosh mm -hmm. Inside King Outside. It's a touchscreen Mac with a proboscis camera. Talk yeah. about oddball things, right? But it was a kiosk, so people could walk right up to it and touch it. Yeah. yeah. I've never had a touchscreen Mac, but I've always seen so many applications for them. Yeah, this is... It's like this. cars. Yeah, look at this. Look at this. Isn't this great? Motorcycles. Look at this. It's a yeah. System 7. Mm -hmm. Look at the cursor going. It's really fun. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Isn't that great? Yeah, some good stuff here. This is... Oh, yeah. This is Data General Nova. Data General Nova, because I looked yeah. at the size of the board. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's a ma it's a mattress, right? It's a full mattress. I don't know how much is on here. Probably four K bytes, maybe eight. I think this I was think a twenty two sides. This them. might be a twenty four K mattress, because um, actually, if we look at it here, it'd be the whole thing. No, how could it? Be? Wait a minute. Let's see what it says. Sixteen K memory stack. Oh, you had to be able to buy that much. Yeah, you could buy that much. So it had to be one board. The Nova only had one board for memory. Hmm. Isn't this a gorgeous sort of combination of the two worlds? It's so fine. I was told that, that the parallel, the 45 degree lines, still had to be threaded by hand. They were made in Japan. Because here's a 1967 core, and you can actually see the donuts pretty much. Mm -hmm. And then by the early 70s, you couldn't see the donuts really. Hmm. They're so small. Hmm. They're still donuts, though. They're still donuts. And this is non volatile RAM, so the RAM is still readable from this if the lines aren't broken. Because hmm. the core doesn't go away. Yeah, that's something we lost. It's like. With typewriters, we had, you know, copies instantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to worry about power outages. Yeah, right. none of that. Now we do. <laughs> <laughs> this is Microsoft versus the world. So this is everything Microsoft, including Windows 1.0, if you can believe it, running. Let's watch okay. Windows boot up. Let's show Windows 1.0. Okay, let's go here. This is, this is oh, Microsoft. this is exciting. This is exciting. Watch this, guys. This is the future, Win. folks. Win. 1985. Let's pretend it's watch, 85. Watch it come up. The splash screen. 1.03. And it grinds away on the B drive. <laughs> and um, and you can barely do anything with it, but you can crash it. It's easy to crash. You can calculate. <laughs> you can calculate. There's a calculator. And here it comes up. It actually boots slower than XP. I think it boots faster than XP. <laughs> I don't know. It depends. Look at this special menu. When did you see a special menu yeah. on window last time? Oh my god. Isn't that incredible? Special uh, and session. Like special shutdown on the Mac. They got away from that pretty quickly. But if we go along here, we've got view, get info. Where do we think that's from, right? <laughs> Windows doesn't do that anymore, but that's the standard way of getting properties of a file. So I can go down here, I'll, I'll get a pop-up. It's going to figure that out for 10 seconds. And there's my prop sheet for the command.com file. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what Windows 1 did. When? Uh, mid 80s. So, Jesus. So that the. Way ahead of things. Yeah, and it was hard. Way ahead of It was of so this. hard. It was yeah, ahead but that's, of not, that's not real graphical. No. Yeah, and I'll show, I can't it, even show it. It's kind of neat to see at some point in time, but. Yeah, it's. Yeah, I'll show it to you. Less than I thought they would. The, oh I wrote God. this entire thing myself. Yeah, and it was sold in 100 countries by Xerox. Right. But this would run on a regular Wilson. old wow. DOS machine. And so I took things from the Mac, like the Dragon Drive. Is that fast? Is that fast? This is like a, I don't know, an 8 megahertz. It really like slow. And novel. you could edit That's images easy. and whatnot. I built the whole thing. And they sold it all over the world to do things like printing your phone bells. And stuff. Uh, it was for layout for huge corporate jobs. And then look, has a clipboard. You can drop things on the clipboard. They could design their own layouts. They could design their own documents. So that sounds like a good machine for Xerox. Yeah, and it was just a PC. But what we did was we brought all the inventions Xerox had done but never capitalized on, and I put them on the, on the DOS machine Not small first. Not Smalltalk. Not Smalltalk, no. Now, I was the first person to bring a graphical interface to DOS like this. Same as Windows 1.0. This is a lot better than that. Yeah. 
But of course, you, you get beaten out by Microsoft. Oh, this is a prototype for the Lisa with the Twiggy floppies. It's a development system. I don't have the front bezel because when Steve changed to three and a half inch floppy, the guys tore their front bezels off, right. bezels on, chucked them out. Where'd you get this from? Oh. Jeff Raskin. I mean, the Twiggy was such a disaster. I hate to take credit for it. It was my idea. We should build our own floppy. We can build it. Look, there's not it that much to a floppy after I've done mine. Huge. So I got, I sucked um, some people that I used to work with at Hewlett Packard. Steve Smith and oh, wow. a couple other engineers. Twiggy. Yeah, in fact, uh, I just yeah. scanned in all the notes for the Twiggy design, which might have been your in your. I had nothing to do with the design. Oh, you no, 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 no. I just said, why don't we build our own floppy disk? And we've got a couple of mechanical guys here. Uh, do you remember the I don't Bro think they were Brooklyn good project? For that. Brooklyn, I remember the name. That's a 16 bit 6502 prototype. Right uh -huh. in there. Isn't that incredible? 16. Um, this is the machine we're going to use in the Apple IIx. Right. Maybe Brooklyn is Apple IIx. Yeah. yeah I, was, I was actually working on that. Yeah. Wasn't, wasn't that what was used in the GS? But then it went to the GS. Um, yeah. I don't know if they went with this. This guy had a company and he had all these plans to keep laying out the chip himself. He had to bring it up to the 16 level version and uh, make it faster and, and basically beat the 68,000 everything. Yeah. 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 This is the prototype for the uh, Mac Portable. Look at that, all engineering plastic and everything. Yeah, but I was the only person that liked it because I was used to carrying Macs everywhere I went. I wanted to carry it yeah. with me, and it was just too awkward for an airplane, and that right. wouldn't fit. Right, and this <laughs> yeah. fit. But it was yeah, CMOS awesome. RAM, so you turned it on, everything's there. When you shut it, it just so basically easy. held itself in a state. You open it up, it's right there. Oh, and Steve, do you remember knockoffs oh. like the Franklin Ace? Like, Feel under here. You know what this is? Right there? The reset button. So every time a nerd yeah. would pull the machine or do oh. something, they would accidentally reset and lose their code. I went over this Franklin booth. I just walked into their first one. I saw it. When they pulled out the board, wait a minute, mm -hmm. the same traces on the PC board. All they did was turn on a copy machine. Jeez. <laughs> you know, why do you go to school to be an engineer? How can you make that computer? You know, I designed it. You know, I'm your chief engineer. You know, why don't you admit it? The press is gathering. The press was gathering around us. The President Franklin said, okay, okay, yes, you are our chief engineer. And I walked away happy, thinking I won the battle, but I should have said, where's my salary? Ah, right, right. Where's my pay? I just wanted credit for having designed their machine. Yeah. How about doing a, a handheld Apple II? Well, you know what they we got the we had the Apple One replicas are easy because I talk about giving the stuff away with no copyrights. Right, but right. the Apple Two is yeah. in trouble. I think. Yeah, I know. I'll talk to Steve. I can Steve would say no because <laughs> doesn't want to tie Apple to images of the Apple Two. Right, we've moved on to the image of Macintosh and. But you know what happened? Right. I can tell you. Maybe there's an out because I got a call from senior legal counsel at Apple two years ago. And I said, am I in trouble? Have I published something? Because we had the Macintosh business plan, the front cover on the net. Yeah. I thought I was going to get in trouble for that. Yeah. And they said, no, Steve has ordered us to get rid of everything on campus that has a rainbow logo on it. And we at the legal department have a big museum. We have machines, all these prototypes. That, and we have a huge truckload of documentation. And I said, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to shred it and junk it? And says, no, we can't. It's against like our Hippocratic oath. We can't <laughs> throw this stuff away. So we interpret what Steve said as dispose means it never comes back on campus. So they brought it here, and they gave it to me. Wow. And then I said to them, I put everything out onto the Creative Commons license so people can use it and share it. That's my philosophy. And they said, fine, we'll sign off on that. So everything that I've got, they have released from council, has released it here, including the notes for the Twiggy Floppy, everything's in there. So wow. I've got a shitload of documentation, even on Apple II, that might constitute the design for the Apple II. That's pretty cool. Mm. They released it all. Because Steve all didn't want it. It's it's here. It's in tubs right above your head. Ooh. Yeah. Mm. Steve yeah, didn't Apple, want it. So an Apple II replica would be great. It could be done before that. Yeah. yeah. Because it was so easy. Yeah, Just exactly. In basic, with pokes, you could actually turn something yeah. on. It it where did that world ever go? And the little... <laughs> Get some oh, totally. What you got for me? You ordered it for me, right? <laughs> sure. It's just, uh, how, how much we appreciate you coming, Waz. This is Steve Wozniak, who co founded Apple, so he's here to see the delivery the of this Apple. iMac 24. Yeah. It's actually for me, but I don't want anybody to know. I'm too embarrassed. I really think it was all that thrilling, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're part of history now. Okay. Gotta witness this. That's it. Here, take some pictures this night. I was like, except for the iMac. You want to sign for it then? Yeah, I'll sign for it. I can sign for it. <laughs> <laughs>
You know how to sign uh, Bruce Damer? Nobody would know. Nobody. Now you don't have to, I don't have to sign anything. Nobody was just put X. Everybody, I'm just the person who signed. Oh, yeah. Okay. The signature guy. Oh, man. It's all here. It's 24-inch. The power book cases are getting so small. Let's go down to the barn and open it up. It'll be the newest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put it in the barn. Put it in the barn. We only put the new stuff in the house. <laughs> you got there, Bruce. This is like 2001 Space Odyssey. The monolith coming out. There are other ways to do it. <laughs> Look at this. Life size. Yeah, I haven't bought a desktop machine in a while. Is that actually you should buy this because this is. Look at this. Isn't this beautiful? That'd probably be the one. Yeah. Dual core, okay. two gigs of RAM. Okay, now let's go uh, go get my pen. Yeah, yes, yeah, dual core, two gigs of RAM. I've got the pen. Wow, wow, it ships with two gigs in the standard version. You can get three gigs in the PowerBooks, the MacBooks now. Really? Oh. For a long time, I was telling people, if you have more than one gig, you'll never see it. But I guess there are some places Perfect. where two isn't enough. Remember yeah, the six, six, six forty k. Remember the. 640k limit in DOS machines. Designed by Apple in California. That's all. You know what? The, the first uh, Mac had this nice uh, foam insert as well. Ah. Where's the computer? This is it? Yeah. <laughs> now, the first program that starts up is the friendliest welcome in all the languages. And it's the one program that should never, ever fail on a computer by the rules of Jeff Raskin. Yeah. The very first program you ever run, might be your first time ever switching to a Macintosh, that program better not fail. So, the, so uh, yeah, yeah, so Apple came out with the new Intel Macs. I bought one of these, one of the iMacs like this, a smaller yeah. one, yeah. for a friend's mother, her yeah. first time ever on a Macintosh, and it got to a point in the program asking questions about dot .Mac account that I had bought her but she didn't have installed yet. Yeah. And I'm trying to answer these questions a couple times and both the forward and back buttons dimmed. Nothing you could do but unplug the power. Oh my God! What a sad story to tell. And then I went to my to my power my first Intel PowerBook. Same thing. It got huh. to a point where it was copying over the data from my old my old PowerBook, and it said an hour and twenty three minutes left to go. Yeah. And it sat there for ten hours. Ooh. I tried it over and over and over for a couple of days till I was out of time, and it was just one bad file, one bad file, and the program would hang and not finish and not tell you it was a bad file, not give you an option. No, you don't do that. This is supposed to be the world for the, for anybody. Yeah. You know I mean, the rest make, of us. Well, I'll make this real easy. Well, you have yes. to plug this in too. So, then, eh? so what? Um, sign it and put the date. Well, I will leave room for Steve Jobs on the left. Okay. <laughs> You're gonna be okay. Do a nice big the right signature. Side. Okay. That'll give it some value. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So oh, put zero, zero, 006.12.14. Those are all binary digits except the six. Oh, can you put Digi DigiBarn on the bottom so we know sure. where it was signed? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's any other DigiBarns. There now. This is it. Okay, guys. Wells will Excellent. stand next to us. Full motion. Yay. Yay. All right. In the DigiBarn. In the, nice. Next to the pigs. It turned out that years later, we did get permission from Apple to release the Apple II Disk Operating System, the source code having been donated to the DigiBarn by the man who wrote it, Paul Lawton. In the ten years since Waz's first visit, numerous wonderful and wondrous artifacts, visitors, and events have come to the DigiBarn. Future Levity Zone podcasts will feature more tales from the DigiBarn in its eternal quest to understand the origin of the nerd. Find this all at my very extensive website at www.digibarn.com. Search for videos online under Steve Wozniak Visits the DigiBarn. And for fun, look for another video of me being beamed into the Cray-1 supercomputer by none other than William Shatner, Star Trek's original Captain Kirk, in a show called How William Shatner Changed the World. Find more podcasts, video, pictures, art, writing, and resources in the Levity Zone at our beautifully rethemed site at www.levityzone.org. Theme music for this episode 
is a 70s disco-tinged electronic beat called Mind Tickle by Kyle Espenshad. Video recording was by Alan Lundell and sound cleanup by Bo Millward and editing and cover art by Dr. Bruce. See you next time in the Levity Zone.